Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are going to do a quick chat about Anna Karenina. I'm just going to do a single video, not a whole series, but I have a lot that I want to cover with you guys, so let's jump right in. So first of all, I want to talk about my personal experience with this novel. I have tried to read this book at least twice before and I was never able to finish it. This time, I don't know if it was the fact that I'm in quarantine or if I've just truly grown as a reader and I'm more skillful. I like to think it's the latter, but I was completely sucked in with this novel. I absolutely loved it. And not only do I think it's phenomenal, I found it also to be very, very fascinating, very, very interesting. And then also just a thoroughly enjoyable reading experience. Tolstoy, this was a triumph. It might just be edging out East of Eden as my all-time favorite book of all time. That is how good this book is. I saw another booktuber's reading vlog that they were taking a look, they had been, maybe been gifted by the publisher, a book that's a retelling of this masterpiece. I believe it's called Anna Kay. I haven't read it. That might be worth checking out if you find this behemoth intimidating as I did for many years. And now it might be a little bit odd to describe my reading experience as like thoroughly enjoyable given how famous this novel is for its tragic ending and by the way like trigger warnings all over this book do look it up this is not suitable for all audiences there's some mental health things that I would definitely warn you about before you pick it up but despite the tragic ending the beautiful prose the carefully crafted inner psychology of the characters and its narrative arc are truly magnificent I find that adaptations of classic novels, whether it's, or, or even books like Anna Kay or movies or miniseries give us, really help us get through big long books like this, big challenging books. I know that Kira Knightley played the eponymous role in a movie that came out maybe about a decade ago. Again, I haven't seen it, but I do remember the advertising because it looked so beautiful, like the costuming and the filming was just like so sumptuous. So it's probably worth watching. Plus Kira Knightley is really a fantastic actress. So I really encourage people to watch adaptations or read adaptations. I actually enjoy watching the adaptation before reading the book. There's a couple of advantages. One, I get to enjoy the movie more. I find that because I'm not waiting around for certain things to happen or expecting the maybe director to interpret the novel the way that I did or represent the characters the way I imagined them. I just get to enjoy the director's version without my own biases sort of like getting in the way of me enjoying the movie. And then I also find that I get to appreciate it as it's as a work of art in its own right. So a lot of times these movies are just like the costuming, the historical research, the sets, the language choices are very, very well researched. They usually have these fantastic expert advisors who are working with them to bring this to life. And I find that again, it's something that I can appreciate more if I'm not sort of like comparing it to the book in my mind. And secondly, I think it also gives me sort of like handles when I'm facing a challenging book. And so I can like anticipate that certain plot points are going to happen. And I can really grab onto them as sort of like handles of understanding as I move through the book. So I honestly, I highly recommend it. Um, if you're sort of intimidated by a big and challenging book, see if there's a movie adaptation of it. And maybe use that as a primer before reading the novel. If you don't like spoilers, then... I don't know what to tell you. For some reason, I'm not bothered by spoilers. It's a thing in our culture and I kind of don't get it. If it's good, me knowing the ending isn't gonna ruin it. Okay, enough about that. Let's get to the good stuff, the themes, the analysis. Let's do this. So a few of my observations. One, it's a fantastic story. I think the best part is the exploration and examination of the inner psychology of many of the characters. Because this book takes its time, you get deeply into the minds and hearts of maybe even like eight or ten different characters. The, you know, with a traditional novel or with a novel of a more normal length, you really only get inside the head of one character. And so I think that's part of why this novel is so expansive. The story focuses on the inner and inter relationships of a social circle, characters connected by family, marriage, and friendship. It's usually pretty helpful to keep a list of the dramatist personae, if you will. I did on the side, even though the characters are often listed in the front of many editions, I still made my own list 
I think it just means that you pay attention better, write down their name. I would suggest write down the name that they're usually referred to by the narrator as well, so like their full name. And then there's usually just like, you know, their first name or weirdly maybe their father's last name. I don't know. I don't understand the Russian conventions for names. And then I usually would put like how they're connected to each other. Oh, so-and-so's sister. Oh, the brother-in-law, blah, 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 or whatever. So in this close examination of the inner worlds of all of these characters, we see played out over and over again how the interplay between character and society results in what feels like an inevitable outcome. Both the essential character of a person and the structure of society feel immovable. So it's almost like the left and right train track, if you will. Trains are a central theme in this book. That's why I use it. Be fantastic. You can write that paper. You're welcome. And it's like personality or character is your right rail and society is your left rail. And like your soul is the train that is like bound by these two rails on these two forces on your inevitable path. And that feeling of inevitability just kind of mounts as the story comes to its tragic conclusion. You can see it coming from far, far, far away, but you barely feel the tension at first until it draws upon you. So the whole structure and feeling of the novel really is, again, very much like a train. There's also a lot of like dualism going on. So there is a set of dualistic pairs contrasted throughout. You get, you know, the country versus the city, and then even within the city, you're contra contrasting Moscow versus St. Petersburg. You have, you know, these family units sort of compared, really represented by Anna and Vronsky on the one hand, and Kitty and Levin on the other. You obviously have the husband and lover of Anna, Karenina, like, contrasted with each other. So we have Vronsky on the one hand, we have Karenin on the other. We have Anna and Vronsky versus Dolly and Oblonsky. You have all these sort of like dualistic pairs being sort of compared and contrasted with each other. And it's a bit like being in a house of mirrors. And in fact, even Anna's like, you know, maid, lady in waiting maid, lady maid, I think her name is Anne too. And so you have this sort of like duplication going on. Another way to think of it is like, what if you're a bead in a kaleidoscope and these things keep getting changed and shifted around you, but it's really the same parts being sort of like duplicated and refracted throughout. And then I also wanted to talk about the influence, uh, or the lack of influence perhaps, of medievalism in the way that this relates. So there are a lot of ethical questions about the emancipation of the serfs from the feudal system. What is the proper relationship now between the landowner and his land and the freed laborers. And so if you like that aspect of Downton Abbey that comes up, you might also like that exploration here as well. But there's like this tension because Russia is very different from Western Europe. And it really didn't exit the Middle Ages in the same way. It didn't go through the same cultural shifts of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the industrialization. And it's almost like they're jumping straight from the Middle Ages straight into industrialization. You can see that most emblemized by the train itself, but it is merely uh, symbolic of all of the other progress that is happening at the same time. It is embodied in the modern city of St. Petersburg, set way further west than Moscow. It is embodied in the behavior of the characters in the city and their lavish lifestyles. So on this topic, Levin's main concern is the fear that the nation, having not gone through the same stages of development, has also not developed the same sort of proper and compensatory infrastructure, societally, politically, or agriculturally, and he's mainly focused on agriculture being a farmer, to basically support this new industrialization. And the best sort of example of this problem is the fact that Stepan Arkadyevich, Dolly's husband and Anna's brother, sort of gets this made up job at the banks who are funding the railroads. And everyone knows that it's a job, it's a made up job and the points don't matter and you know, everything is made up situation, but he can get this job. He can continue to fund his lavish, lavish lifestyle that's beyond his means. He's already squandered the money from selling off, off a big forested piece of land that was part of Dolly's inheritance and her like, um, what's the word? You know, what should, the money that she brought into the marriage. And so it's like he sold off the land. He doesn't appreciate the land and the agriculture and like the source of wealth 
very Jeffersonian perhaps in that way. And instead he, you know, goes in the direction of being this sort of like speculator banker who's supporting this industrialization that's sort of destroying the country at the same time while they live this like lavish and excessive lifestyle. It's not a very well formulated argument, I realize, but you get the, maybe the sense of what I'm trying to say. And the idea that comes across is that they're sort of building these industrial ca castles on clouds while squandering the natural resources that ultimately support said industrial castles that are in the clouds. It's like you just push it and the whole thing's going to collapse, right? But it isn't just, you know, a social or an agricultural disjunction. The novel itself sort of stands in this literary dis disjunction. The fact that Russian literature really has no precedent for a romance. Now, this may be top of mind for me because I just finished Chrétien de Troyes' Arthurian Romances. I know you guys are probably hearing, tired of hearing me say Chrétien de Troyes' Arthurian Romances. I get it. But the fact remains that all of literature is like this massive spider web of interconnected ideas. And then if I read them all, then I can understand the entire universe and be really, really well prepared to face the world. Those are some of my anxieties coming out. Anyway, so the Russians didn't really touch the development of Arthurian romances. Those really developed in England and in France in the Middle Ages. So Anna Karenina seems, and this is my theory, seems to be dealing with those same issues sort of incarnated now into Russian literature. So some of the ideas that Anna is dealing with that we also see happening um, in Russian literate, or I mean in uh, medieval romances. One, how do you deal with human love and romance upon the backdrop of your Christian faith, which is the story of divine love? Two, which is then tying in with the ethical question of how to deal with laborers and landowners, because the Christian ethic brings in this idea of the intrinsic value of every single person because they're made in the image of God. This is a question of hierarchy and power which is then also a question of relationships between a man and his wife. In Arthurian romances, this takes on the question of Queen Guinevere, her relationship with King Arthur, and then also her romance with Sir Lancelot. Because she is compelled to give her love to her husband, Arthur, who is also her king, we have this question of, is that love? Is that duty? Can love be obligated? Or... Is it true love when she has the power to give her love away to somebody who is lower on the social hierarchy in the position in a lower position of power, such as Sir Lancelot? So for these stories, the conclusion is that love can only go where it is freely given. So that's the exploration of the dynamics between power and love. But because it's a violation of the ethical law, then love becomes inextricably linked with death. The fulfillment of human love always has to end in death. But the fulfillment of divine love, on the other hand, though death is still required, Jesus has to die, but is able to sort of like resurrect and continue into salvation. And that's how religion resolves the same question of romance, of love, of power and hierarchy. And so we're wondering how do we do that with a secular love, with a human love. So in conclusion, it seems to me that Anna Karenina is trying to take on like the whole freaking project of the Arthurian romances, which literally took several hundred years to iterate through, but just in one novel. This like blows my mind. I'm, my mind is so blown right now. It is a triumph of literature. That is all, that is all I have to say. It is a to write up and I highly recommend it. Until next time, <laughs> I'm Alexandra and in case you were wondering, I'm still a bibliophile.